everyone. Welcome to Girls Can, a series of podcasts created to help educate and inform young women throughout the world. Our goal is to empower and inspire the next generation because the girls of today become the future leaders of tomorrow. Hey everyone, it's Elizabeth. I'm sitting here with my sister, Brooke, today in the studio. Brooke, why don't you tell us who we're interviewing today? On the phone today, we have Dr. Jessica Grayson. Dr. Grayson is the chief resident in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She has recently been accepted into one of the most prestigious interior school-based fellowship programs in the world with Dr. Richard Harvey in Sydney, Australia. Dr. Grayson is here to tell us about her experience as a surgeon in the medical field while discussing the importance of leading an organized and well-balanced life. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Grayson. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, it's Elizabeth. How did you decide that you wanted to become a surgeon? Really, I think it's something that I thought I wanted to do my whole life. I know that's really cliche, but even as a kid, I was really interested in being a surgeon, being a doctor, and I actually bought a book when I was in elementary school called Brain Surgery for Beginners, (laughs) which I still have. And then it was really over the next 10 years that I kind of found myself in situations with people that were friends with my parents or career days at school where I got to go and spend some time shadowing some of these people and that completely solidified the fact that that was something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. How did you decide specifically that you wanted to be an ENT? That's an interesting story, actually. So I had not a lot of knowledge about what ENTs did, except for taking out tonsils and adenoids, since they did that for me when I was 11. But when I was in high school, I actually played softball, and I got a softball line drive to the face down the first baseline and had some pretty extensive facial fractures. And the doctor that I saw in my hometown sent me to see an ENT, and that, that ENT doctor actually did my reconstructive surgery. And so that was actually my first insight into all the other things that they did. And so when I started medical school, I was kind of like, oh, let me see what else they do. And I found out that they take care of all kinds of things, ear problems, sinus problems, patient trauma, head and neck cancers, sleep disorders. I mean, you name it, and they're taking care of it. And so it was really my own personal injury that actually made me even consider that that was something I wanted to do. Wow, it's really interesting. Dr. Grayson, this is Brooke. Being yeah. a surgeon must be extremely time-consuming. I was wondering how you juggle your occupation along with other aspects of your life. It is certainly time-consuming. I think that time management and prioritizing the things that are important to you are the most important thing. There's a lot of talk about whether or not women can have it all. Can you have a family? Can you have a job? Can you have hobbies? And can you be happy and somehow be able to give 100% of yourself to all of those things? Uh, and the truth of the matter is, you cannot, there's only 100% of you. You can only give that one total 100% somewhere. And so for me, I prioritize what's important to me. So my job obviously is important. I mean, I have a husband and a son. And so they become at the top of the list, as well as my own personal wellness and health and that stuff. And so for me, I have a lot of support. So work, friends, I, my spouse is very supportive, I have family support, I have local friend support. And that helps kind of make me feel like I can still manage to do all of those things and do them well. But we're human, right? So there are days where I don't feel like I do everything perfectly well, and that's okay because the next day I get to try it all over again. But it's, it's a struggle to make those things work, but I'm dedicated to being all of those things. And I recognized and knew even before I did all of this and before I had a child, before I got married, that it was going to take some juggling. And I think if you know that going into something like that, then you can be prepared and you can do anything. I mean, if you know what it takes to do it, you can be successful. That's really how I manage it. Um, And some days are harder than others, but that's okay. That's great advice. My dad said that you were doing a fellowship with Dr. Richard Harvey in Australia. That's right. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, Dr. Harvey is does rhinology and anterior skull-based surgery, which is basically sinus surgery and then operations at the 
front of the brain. And so it's a lot of assistance with some neurosurgical procedures, but also a lot of things that just the ENT doctors do on their own. And the purpose of all of that is that we do all of that without making a single incision on the face. And so surgeries that people had 30 years ago that required a huge incision from ear to ear over the top of their head, that had to shave their head. Now we can all do with telescopes and instruments through the holes that exist in your nose. They're already there. And so this particular gentleman in Australia is actually at the forefront of the field and very well known, very well published, doing lots of research, involved in lots of meetings, and is actually a good friend of Dr. Woodworth, who's at UAB. And so they kind of discussed this potential opportunity for me. And I met with them and actually got to go visit them in Australia and see what they're doing and kind of how things are run there, and I'm getting the opportunity to spend a year and train with him, which is pretty incredible because of how fantastic he is and um, the different skill set that he brings that we may not get an opportunity to see a lot of since he doesn't live in the United States. That is so impressive. I have to ask, what is your favorite part of your job? The people, for sure. So there's a very few professions that exist that you get to know people so intimately. Social workers and your pastor, minister, those are those people who get to know everything about somebody. The things that they're afraid of, their deepest secrets, you know, the things that family support issues, what else is going to be affecting their health? We're privy to that. And that is an incredible responsibility, but it's also something that makes me feel very fulfilled, that I know that they, I may be helping them deal with this very difficult thing, and I might be the only person that knows about it. And that is an incredible way to feel that someone trusts you so much to tell you those things or to allow you to operate on them. I mean, they sign a piece of paper and they say, yes, I trust you to allow me to be put to sleep and render essentially helpless requiring all assistance from the physicians and nurses and team and do to me what you think is best for me and then wake me up safely and take care of me. That is an incredible amount of trust. I don't take it lightly and I think that that's probably the best part of my job uh, is to get to spend time with those people and build a relationship where they can trust me to do those things. It seems very scary that you have someone's life in your hands. How do you deal with that anxiety and that fear. Um, That, I think, is the driving factor for why we always are constantly reading, constantly learning, constantly pushing to be better. And you can't be paralyzed by that fear. You have to recognize it. You have to respect the anatomy or the disease process or the, you know, the issues, the complications that could arise, but you can't let them paralyze you because if you do, then then you won't be able to respond if a situation like that were to happen. Um, But you treat every patient the same way and kind of go through a protocol or a checklist. This is how we manage this problem. This is how we manage the complications to this problem. And when those issues happen, and they do present from time to time, and then they do, you know, those are always wonderful learning opportunities as well. You manage them. You do everything you can to protect that person and keep them safe. And then you spend that time after that. Once that's all done, you reflect on it and say, okay, here's what happened. Why did this happen? Could I have done something to prevent it? If so, what could that have been? And then you learn from that and move on to the next thing. You have to figure out a way to channel that energy because I do think that it could really begin to weigh a lot on a person if you don't. And so everybody has an outlet. Mine is running. So if I've had a difficult day at work and I need to process through some things that have happened, I go for a long run and I just kind of think through how, you know, how could we have done this differently you know, even when things bad don't happen, just how do you make it better? Because we should be constantly evolving and making things better for the next patient, for the next generation, for the next set of physicians, whatever the situation might be. Um, but I use it to, as my motive to keep reading, keep learning, keep pushing, and not to give up on the profession. Yeah, that's very insightful. What is the most difficult part of your job? I think the most difficult part is when things don't happen the way you want them to. So whether that be, you know, a cancer diagnosis a patient wasn't expecting or we've reached the end of all of our treatment options or even something not life-threatening but quality of life altering where you hoped that you could repair their hearing or 
you know, improve their breathing or whatever the situation might be, depending on what subspecialty of ENT you're talking about, and you don't get the outcome that you wanted. You t- I mean, it, it, it feels personal because the patient trusted you, you gave everything you had, and so it stinks when it doesn't work out that way, and I think that's hard. What is one piece of advice you have for young girls interested in going into medicine? Ooh, be strong. Be strong, girls. Um, you can do it. I um, was very lucky to have parents who felt like I could do anything. Not everybody has that situation, but find somebody in your life who believes in you no matter what. And when you feel like you can't do it, go to that person and let them push you and support you because it is a marathon and not a sprint. And that's true for medicine or for anything that you decide to do with your life. But keep pushing. You can do it. And there is a place for you. Uh, I think that's been something that's come at the forefront a lot recently is where women stand now. I mean, it's 2018 and we feel like we've made all these strides, but there are still some places where there are fences that we are having to climb. And I think that in medicine, particularly, women have done a fantastic job. Uh, And you guys probably well know, I think your uh, mom, right, is also Mm -hmm. uh, a physician. And so she's, she's fought this battle, right? And there is a place at the table for women who want to change the world, whether it be through medicine or business or politics or whatever. And so keep on keeping on and believe in yourself because you empower other girls to do what you're doing, but you also possess an incredible knowledge, intuition, sensitivity, things that other people can't bring to the table. That was amazing. Have you ever personally faced struggles that you've had to overcome as a professional woman? Oh, yeah. (laughs) There are still, unfortunately, people out there who don't think you belong, who think that your job is at home. Um, And I would say that for people who choose to work at home. That's an incredible job and one that I probably could not do all the time and I have a lot of respect for the women who do that. But it is sometimes difficult to change opinions of people and I think that the times that I've run into that where there have been other uh, males in the profession or even other women in the profession who just want to give you a hard time and be an obstacle for you to try to overcome to be successful. You just got to say, look, you know, mind over matter and you don't matter. So we're not going to worry about you. There being a mom and being in medicine, I think has been the most recent struggle that I've dealt with, which I think has been harder than just being a female in the profession. You know, trying to figure out how you manage your time between what you need as a mom. So I, I need to see my child what my child needs from me, um, what I need to provide for him, and then also managing the expectations from work on what what that looks like. And I, it's a constant, that's constantly in flux for me. So there were certainly people who were not happy that I was having a baby, but we did it. We had a baby. We successfully have, you know, continued working and taking care of people. And so we made it all work. And I actually had a really wonderful boss who's a a man who told me that you cannot wait until it is convenient for other people for you to live your life. Mm -hmm. You have to live your life. And there will be struggles as there are for anybody, and you just roll with them when they happen. And so that's what I took into that. And so the people, the naysayers who were annoyed that I would need some time off of work to have a baby or that my that my priorities might change a little bit because I now had another human depending on me 24-7. I just said, you know what? That's fine. You can feel that way. And I'm not going to let how you feel bother me because it doesn't matter. What matters is that I provide good care to my patients and a loving, supporting, nurturing home for my child. And that's all that matters. Dr. Grayson, we admire you so much. I mean, you have a really difficult job and you do it well. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I've enjoyed I've enjoyed um, getting to spend some time with your father and talk about you girls and all the things that you guys are doing. <laughs> I'm pretty impressed. Well, you're a wonderful example to all of us. So um, I did have a few more questions, if that's okay. Yeah, um, of course. How did you get where you are today? You're very successful, but what was your journey like? I... I mean, I grew up in a really small town, so uh, I grew up in Fayette, Alabama. It's about four to 5,000 people and pretty small high school and had a lot of social support. So growing up in a small town, 
you have a lot of people that know you know your parents. And so I can't say that I did any of this by myself at all. I had wonderful mentors that helped me. My primary care physician in my hometown was my mentor and helped me get to medical school. And my parents were very supportive. I have an older sister um, who's brilliant and was also very supportive and helpful at me uh, following my dreams. And But I think I really had a pretty traditional pathway. I mean, I went to college. Um, I did get a master's degree after college because I finished college a little early and my acceptance for medical school was a year after that. And so I spent some time getting an extra degree just to try to help really provide me with some extra knowledge that I could use in medicine. I spent some time doing some public health and uh, stuff in underserved areas of Alabama, which was really nice. And then even in medical school, my parents were, were super supportive. I, if anybody deserves that medical degree and the residency diploma, it's my parents because they were there when I didn't feel like I could do it anymore. When I was tired, exhausted, and didn't believe in myself, my mom was like, you got this. I'm coming to Birmingham. We're going to go spend the afternoon doing something you enjoy, and then you can restart tomorrow. And so that is really kind of the, I think, the, the guiding light that got me to where I am. After medical school, I, I got married after medical school, and so residency training is hard. As you guys have probably heard about uh, from your parents, but it's very difficult because you are not the boss of your own schedule for that time period. So for five years, you are whatever you need to be for the job, for the bosses, for the patients, for whoever. And so I had a very, very, very patient, kind, and loving husband who said, you do what you got to do, and I'll take care of everything else. And that took a lot of stress off of me. That meant that I could put my you know, my eyes directly on the prize and I could spend whatever time I needed to do to do my job well. And I knew that everything else was going to be okay. Would you encourage your child to go into medicine? If that's what he wants to do, I would. You know, I think that because it's a tough job and it requires such a time commitment, both in training and afterwards, that I think you have to really love it to do it. And so if that is what makes him happy, then I will support him 150%. But if there is something else in this life that he wants to do, then I'll support him to do that too. Um, I don't want him to feel like he has to be in medicine because his mom is. Um, I want him to do it because that's what he's passionate about and that the thing that fulfills him and makes him feel like he's left something behind for the future generation. Dr. Grayson, we have one last question. Um, okay. Do you have a favorite book that you would recommend for young girls to read? Mm, that is a good question. I liked Pride and Prejudice because in that book, one of the female characters kind of throws all of the normal ways that women are supposed to act to the wind. And she says, you know what, forget that. That doesn't work for me. And she becomes who she wants to be and does it kind of against convention. So I like that because I feel like I haven't always followed all the convention either and have tried to push the envelope and be super successful when I could and be aggressive at obtaining those goals. So I would recommend that one if you guys haven't read it. I've read that book and it's one of my favorites too. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for talking with us today, Dr. Grayson. I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot and I'm sure all our listeners will too. It was a pleasure. Yeah, you're welcome. We know you're very busy, so thank you for taking time out of your schedule to interview with us. Absolutely. Good luck with all you guys' future endeavors. You too. Good luck with your fellowship in Australia. (laughs) Thank you. This has been Girls Can, a podcast and an organization dedicated to improving the lives of young women in our community. We want to encourage young women to make a difference through education and service. Because the girls of today become the future leaders of tomorrow. Because the girls of today become the future leaders of tomorrow.